Welcome to another edition of what we'll call for right now, Pastor David's devotional. You know, in times like these, we have a tendency to worry a lot. We worry about finances, family, health, the economy. Some people are worried about the end of the world. Came across a good definition of worry. Worry is a conversation with yourself about things that you cannot change. Worry is a conversation that you have with yourself about things that you cannot change. But attached to that definition of worry is, an, is a definition of prayer. Prayer is a conversation you have with God about things that he can change. We've all heard the statement, why pray when you can worry? That doesn't make much sense, but we all do it, especially during these times like now when we face these difficulties in our country and around the world. I went on to the website of John Hopkins University uh, today and the, they're the experts on global health, uh, infectious diseases, emergency preparedness and all that. And as of 3 p.m. on March 26, of the 500,000 cases of the virus confirmed worldwide, 120,000 have recovered. Only 23,000 have died. Of course, those 23,000 are important to people, to other people, but that's a small percentage of the total. Of course, the vast majority of those who died are elderly, were elderly, or had uh, existing health issues such as diabetes, cancer, breathing problems, etc. But even so, we still worry. I saw the morning news, I think it was the national news, yesterday I believe it was, and the lady said, we are here to help you make sense of it all. Well, you know what? That didn't really make me want to cuddle up to the TV set and drink in every word that she said. Some people are sure they know the answer, even though they don't. Reminds me of the lady that was talking about a preacher that she liked. She said, he's not always right, but he's always sure of himself. Well, people have a tendency to ask why, and it's natural. There were a couple of times in the life of our Lord Jesus while he was here on earth where he was asked questions. There was a time when some Galileans were murdered by Pilate. Another time... A tower fell on 18 people and killed them. Jesus didn't tell them why those things happened. He pointed them to repentance. He pointed them to the fact that one day they will die also. Another occasion, a boy was born, a little baby was born, and he was born blind. And someone came to Jesus and said, Who, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, it was kind of a dumb question. The man didn't sin before he was born. But nevertheless, Jesus didn't tell them why other than pointing to his own glory. I'm going to display, I'm going to do something through this circumstance. But you know, God doesn't always tell us why. You know, in the book of Romans, we're told things that we don't know and we're told things that we do know. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, it says, We know not what we should pray for as we ought. Sometimes we just don't know how to pray for certain, certain things. We're not quite sure what we should ask God for. But then on the other hand, Romans 8, 28 says something we do know. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, who are the called? The called in this context are people who have trusted Christ as Savior. They're true believers in the Lord Jesus. They've seen themselves as lost and hell-bound sinners, undeserving of heaven. They've seen that Jesus died and rose for them and paid for all their sin. And they have come to Jesus and put their trust in him. They belong to him. They are the called. But even the called, even Christian people who know that when they leave this life, they're going to go to heaven, in spite of this, 
tremendous truth. They still fret and stew about things. Warren Worsby, Bible teacher now in heaven, said these words. He said, most Christians are being crucified on a cross between two thieves, yesterday's regrets and tomorrow's worries. That's right. Regrets and worries rob us of our joy and blessing today. Something comes into our lives that bothers us, worries us, hurts us, and we focus and we concentrate on that one circumstance and it robs us of all of our joy. The Bible says all things work together for good. If you take a cake mix, uh, you know, one cup of unsweetened cocoa powder, uh, two and a half cups of all-purpose flour, you know, two cups of sugar, two, two teaspoons of baking powder, whatever, and you, you put all those things together and you have something that is good. But try just eating two and a half cups of flour all by itself. Or how about a teaspoon of salt or three large eggs at room temperature? Not going to taste too good. We, we, we need to be careful not to concentrate on just one aspect of our lives, one slice of our entire life and say this is, we need to look at it the way God sees it. All things work together for good to those that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. They work together for good. And what is that purpose? Romans 8, 29 tells us, for whom he did uh, foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to his image. Jesus Christ is conforming us to his image. He's making us more like himself. He is sanctifying us. He is refining us. He is working in our lives to make us more holy, more righteous, more glorifying to God so that we can be a channel of God's blessing to others. All things do work together for good. I remember a story about a man that was abandoned on an island. I don't know whether he had a plane wreck, but he ended up being alone on this island. I don't know how long he was there, but he had built himself a hut on the beach, and every once in a while a plane might come by and he'd try to get their attention. they are probably looking for him, but they didn't see him. And so he would go back into the woods and he would forage for food and then come back. One day he was out in the woods and he looked back toward the shore and he saw smoke rising and he thought, oh no. And he went back and there his hut was burning. The very worst thing that he thought could happen to him happened and he despaired until an airplane came by and he found out later that the airplane had seen his smoke signal. So the very thing that he thought was the worst thing that could happen was the very best thing that could happen in the whole context of things. And so why should we worry when we can pray? During these days when we need encouragement to keep walking with God and doing right, let's not worry. Let's pray. These days we're encouraged to be a social distance from people, not to get close. We need to do what James said. Rather than being near to human beings, James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's James chapter 4 and verse 8. So I encourage you this day, dear Christian, when you find your heart fretting and worrying, remember all things work together for good to those that love God. And draw near to God. Get alone with him and pray and talk to him with your open Bible and fellowship with him and allow him to quiet your heart. Let's draw near to God right now and pray together. Father, thank you for those that are watching and listening right now. Father, please help us all to rest in your care for our lives, to rest in your sovereign purposes for us. Help us to willingly and joyfully submit to our circumstances that are no surprise to you at all. May we rest in your care. May we draw near to you 
on a regular basis. May we experience you calming our fears because we're resting in your loving and wise sovereignty. Oh Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, dear Christian. Until next time we meet.